Three, two, one. Okay, and we are live. I'm with Ethan Lau, the author of Once a Bitcoin Miner. How are you, Ethan? I am well, a little tired, but otherwise. How okay. about you? I'm, I'm fantastic. I just uh, scarfed down some sushi. That was pretty yummy, I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, so just to, I guess, set some context. I, was it your publisher or I guess some, someone from your team had reached out to me not too long ago. So I usually I do a baseline in terms of like where we met. So we don't really know each other. Yeah, someone from your team recently reached out to me. And then you and I talked about this book that you're, is it already out or is it just, is it coming out? Oh yeah, it just came out. Ooh, okay. I think in the UK it's coming out next week, but in Canada it's out. Amazing. So just being able to write a book, getting it out there. Congratulations. That's a big, that's oh. a big deal, man. <laughs> Thank uh, you. And, and then you told me a bit more about your story. I, I hadn't heard too much about this. And, but then when you told me about it, I was just like, wow, this is, sounds fascinating. So let's dig into it. But before we do, let's start with you. Where does your story begin? Where are you from originally? What's, uh, how does that all begin? I was born in China, but I grew up in Germany and I'm here in Canada now and I'm a journalist. I write a column in the Financial Post and I used to write for Reuters and like all people, we, I, I contain multitudes and I was also an early Bitcoin investor and I know early is a subjective term, so I got in at around 2013 and I recently wrote a book about all that. Interesting. Cool. Okay. Wow. That's a good short intro, but sounds interesting. So you were born in China, grew up in Germany, and you now live in Canada and you're a writer for the financial polls. What did you study to be a writer or did you fall into that path? I'm curious. Sorry. I don't meet uh, people that write for the financial post every day. Yes, I did. I, I studied journalism. So I, I graduated 2015 and went through a couple of internships. I think my first big boy job was with the Toronto Star. And I was there for, I was there, I was interning there while in school as well. So altogether three years and then Reuters after that. And here I am. Interesting. And how did you first hear about Bitcoin? You said you got in, in 2013. That, that is, those are very early times. Yeah, so this one time, my friends and I, we were just poking about on the dark web just for no good reason. (laughs) And that was when Silk Road was still running. That was, those were the Ross Galbraith days. And yeah, that's how I first encountered Bitcoin because that was the medium of exchange on the dark web. Interesting, interesting. And, And when you discovered it, you were in Canada at the time? You were writing already and you were living here in Toronto? Yep, that's correct. Uh, mostly internships, though. Interesting. And were you also, I don't know, part of the Toronto scene early on, like Decentral? Had you attended any of that? Or I don't know. I know the meetup scene was pretty pretty big back in the day. Yeah, so I, I did interact quite a bit with Anthony DiOrio, but I wouldn't say I was part of the scene. So I, I went to a few meetups, but it was mostly because I, w- I was at the same time also writing about this. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. I, I know we probably want to spend most of our time talking about the experience. So what did, so what happened? Where do you want to start? This is on you. You're a storyteller, so I probably don't need, need to do too much framing here, but where do you want to take this? I'm, I'm really excited about uh, digging in. I'm sure we'll get to the most interesting bits later. They say the the best way to tell a story is always chronologically. So I will start from when I first bought Bitcoin. And I think everyone has a different story about their journey into this space. And, but it's almost never instantaneous. I know for some people it is, but it wasn't so for me. Like when I first heard of Bitcoin, I, and I thought maybe there was some value to this technology, but I didn't feel it on like a 10. I felt it on maybe like a three or a four. It took me a while to get there. So that took a whole year. And part of that was that involved a conversation with Anthony DiOrio. And afterward, 
the last day of 2013, I bought Bitcoin. And then it just fell 50%. And I just thought to myself, what the hell was I doing? So back then it was only a thousand bucks. So it fell from a thousand to 500. So that was your introduction. I, I remember those days <laughs> because we had launched Unocoin at uh, December, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> and the price uh, took a big dip right afterwards or it went on sale. <laughs> And then what happened? So you, how did you, what was your experience like? Was it uh, through the ATM machine then at Decentral or? No, I, ah, <laughs> <laughs> I met Gerald Cotton at one of those meetups. You should write a book about that. <laughs> oh, the, the, that is in my book, but nice. I did not know at the time that he was like involved with all these scams and that he would later go on to be accused of taking users for himself and just gambling it on on highly risky trades but at the time he seemed like a decent chap and i think there were very few places in canada where you could like go on an exchange and buy with canadian dollars and you, you mentioned the atm yeah and so i think everyone at one point had had an account on quadriga and mm. eventually when he was reported dead mm. and i I say reported dead because yeah, some yeah people, I know why you're saying it. They say it's not actually it. dead. But, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, uh, I had 13 ethers still on it. I actually stopped using it for Damn. a while, and mm. 13 ethers it wasn't that much at the time, but it's a lot now. And mm -hmm. those 13 ethers are gone. That's too bad. That's too bad. Yeah, we could probably do a whole episode on just Quadriga and all that. I've never really touched the topic. I, I actually <laughs> did meet them as well, and. Uh, and uh, they actually, believe it or not, in my first meeting with them, they, I say, because it was him and his, I forget his name. Oh, that criminal guy? guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They came up to me at a meetup one day and they just wanted to talk to me because I was working for a, I was working for a company called Buttercoin at the time, backed by Google and this and that. We were launching a, a Bitcoin exchange and they were, they had theirs and they're like, are you Sunny Ray? I was like, ah, who, who's asking? And then they're like, yeah, let's go for it. And then, and then long story short, they ended up telling me actually the fact that they were criminals at one point. And that's how they met. <laughs> oh, wow, I, I came home that day. I told my wife, we are to stay away from that exchange. Let's never interact with them. But I always get scared about talking about them because like you said, are they really dead? Are they not? And the last thing you want is a you know billionaire dead guy after you <laughs> oh, it shows you're a good interviewer you uh first meeting you got them to admit their deepest darkest secrets mm -hmm. they were bragging about it actually oh my god uh -huh. yeah anyway so continue as you were so that was your introduction so you bought your first first uh, ether there and then and okay so you met anthony and these guys anthony inspired you and what what happens after that well, I, I stopped looking at this for a while, like throughout, I, I did buy more during the winter, I guess the crypto winter of 2015, mm. when Bitcoin went to as low as 200, but I, I didn't really touch the space then, but 2016, that was when Anthony DiOrio got hired at the Toronto Stock Exchange mm -hmm. and that was when I was at Reuters. I was writing about him again. And that kind of at least pulled at least my, my mind back into this space. I started looking at it more. And that was the beginning of the great Bitcoin 2017, which was a mm -hmm. period of, I think, both riches, hope, hype, absurdity. Everything just rolled into one. And that was my truly formative period in this space. And that's mostly what the book depicts. And that was when I went to North Korea with Virgil Griffith. In 2017? Uh, no, in, I guess that was the, that period, 2017 to 2018, 2019. I would, like, I think of that as his own period. I don't know if uh, other people mm. think like that as well. Oh, I definitely think, I don't know, I, I'm, it resonates with me. I'm sure people who've been in this space for a long time I can remember these periods as well. And while the name Virgil obviously resonates and I, I've heard of his story, I'm sure there's so many new people coming into this space and everything that many people probably haven't. So for those who haven't, who's Virgil? 
he at the time he was the uh, head of special projects at the Ethereum Foundation, and mm. I think to me it was like a, a big deal in crypto. And at the time, North Korea of all places was organizing a crypto conference. He, I, six other people went there, and I should say I didn't know him prior to North Korea. The first time I met him was uh, was in Beijing, like right before our flight, and he. Eventually got arrested over that, and hmm. he pleaded guilty. In- okay, so there was a lot just happened there in for five words. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> how do you just agree, given that you were I don't know the China, Germany, Canada, Reuters, all of this, and then how did you just all of a sudden decide to get on a plane to go to North Korea <laughs> because there was a conference? Right. <laughs> we have conferences here. Yeah, so uh, I should say that this was something open to the public. They advertised this, and anyone could go. And I have always wanted to go to North Korea. Hmm. And the and I know like lots of people are fascinated about this place, but I also have a, a personal curiosity because my father used to always tell me when I would tell him about all the weird stuff coming out of North Korea, he would say that's not weird at all. That's like the China where I, in which I grew up. But China has changed a lot throughout the years. It's really very different from China in like 1960s, 1970s, but North Korea has remained stagnant. And I always think that if I were to go to North Korea, it'll be a time capsule. I can see the land in which my father grew up. So that was a personal reason. And there was also the crypto reason because... North Korea, it's subject to lots of sanctions and crypto, mm. theoretically at least, mm. it's a way to, to get out of those sanctions. And North Korea has been accused of doing lots of shady stuff with crypto. And I thought when they were holding a conference, I could get like a front row seat into, into what was happening in North Korea. I can talk to the crypto folks and for the first time, pull back the... So... Yeah, that, that that was why I went, and I think were you everyone... scared to go at all? Were you scared? No, not even a little bit. Not really. <laughs> As a but... foreigner, is it like I just don't hear? I don't think I've ever heard of anyone visiting North Korea. To be honest, <laughs> I've been to China. That's different, but I I haven't heard people visiting North Korea. Oh, not, yeah. not even yeah yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, people don't often go, but it's, it's not unheard of. Like they. They bring tourists in all the time. You can go on organized tours. Like, mm. I think you can't do it right now because of the pandemic. But before the mm. pandemic, anyone could just go. Yeah, so I, I wasn't overly worried. Okay, like, so he, then what he, happened? So, uh, sorry, you go there, you're in the airport, and you meet Virgil. Like, what's he about? Or what's he like? I, I don't think I've ever met the guy. <laughs> He is a very interesting guy, and I think he's very smart. I absolutely respect him for his intellect. Like just talking to him, I could tell that he had at least 10 or 20 IQ points more than me. And not that I'm like a high bar or whatever, but he was just like a really smart guy. But I I think at the same time, that intelligence, it came with a type of curiosity and transparency. And he's... And not in a bad way, like in a very nice and open way. Everybody loved him. Even Mm. the North Koreans loved him. (laughs) But yeah, yeah. But I think that was how also how he ended up where he is right now. Because he talked to the authorities very willingly when he went back. And I don't think he ever suspected that they were trying to nail him on something until it was too late. Wait, sorry, what authorities, where, like, what happened in the chronological storytelling here? I, sorry, I'm confused. Where, where <laughs> yeah, I was. So what happened? So, well, but, but, okay, so, yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay, so before I delve into the chronology, mm. one, one interesting tidbit about Virgil. I remember distinctively this one time he said he was, uh, he popped his collar and his collar was popped. And I think the North Koreans were asking him, why you popped your collar? And he said, oh, I'm just doing this for the ladies. And he made a joke, but the North Koreans, they don't get it because that's like some North American slang. So they're like, what mm. the hell are you talking about? And he went on to explain this North American slang to the locals. 
and he explained it very well. And that was a very interesting moment, but it shows like how, and how, how much of an open guy he is. But anyway, Americans, they cannot go to North Korea without express permission because there was a kid who went there. He got detained. He was accused of stealing a flag or something and he eventually died. North the U.S., they just ban everyone. And so, so Virgil's from the U.S.? Uh, yes, he's an American citizen. Mm, and he's from where? Like, where we're about? Alabama. But Alabama. He, he lives in Singapore. But he, he was born in Alabama. Okay. So before he went, he tried to seek permission from the State Department. When he was going in, the government already knew that he was going in because they actually denied him the permission, but he went anyway. Mm. And so I think they had their eye on him from the moment this whole thing started. And later, even when we were in North Korea, he was telling us he was going to meet with State Department officials to tell them about the meeting. Okay. And wh- about what meeting, though? He spoke at the conference? Did he have some private meeting where he told them something? Like, what? why? I, I, sorry, I'm just confused. Like I, like I just said, I know peripherally, probably like most of the audience, what, like, what kind of happened there but what what did happen (laughs) so we had a conference and basically i i think of it as crypto 101 there really wasn't anything talked about that wasn't publicly available Mm. and also i think while virgil he might have gone there as a speaker because he's an ethereum big shot the rest of us, we were going there simply as participants. But on the first day, they told us, you are actually not here to hear from the North Koreans. The North Koreans are here to hear from you. You are the conference. And lots of this, I, I declined to speak, but lots of the speakers, they just made up stuff just a day or two beforehand. <laughs> and it was that kind of conference. But how many people I, were at this conference? Maybe 60 North Koreans. 60? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe six, 60. And they were to... just people? They were the government? They were, you don't know? In North Korea, there is no private enterprise. So everyone works for the government. But mm, we don't really know who they were. We, we, didn't, we were not allowed to have any one-on-one interaction with them. And... I think some of them, when they got up to ask a question, they might have introduced themselves, but we all in all, yeah, we had no idea who they were. You weren't even allowed to talk to them. I guess we weren't explicitly told that we weren't allowed, but the way the whole thing was set up was that there was like this, imagine like a bigger version of a boardroom and there's this table in the center and, and like, on the sides of the tables, like everyone was sitting around there and they would all be gathered there. And in the morning when the conference began, they would bring the eight of us in and we would sit in the center and the speakers will talk. And at the end of it, they take the eight of us and they lead us. So yeah, we we weren't given a chance to interact. So there's only 60 people, North Koreans there, and then eight of you guys, you, Virgil, and a handful of other guys that just making up presentations as they go, public information type of deal. Interesting. Okay. So what do you think? And, and, and what, the air, I guess, feels the same there, right? What, the trees look the same? It's just, like, what's different about North Korea? Did, was there anything that stood out, like coming from Toronto and stuff? Or Oh, yeah, so many things stood out. Yeah. That was just a whole different world. Um, yeah, I bet. Yo, they... When we were going in, they, they were just searching the laptops of people. They, they didn't actually search mine, but they, they searched someone else's and they found pictures of his ex-girlfriend okay. and they, they construed that as porn and they took his laptop away, but they gave it back when we left. But that was like the first thing that, that we encountered when, when we Wait, that was there. one of you guys? Like one of the eight people that visited? Yes. Ah. Yes. Okay. 
<laughs> but if he had pictures of his current girlfriend, would that have been allowed? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think it matters <clears throat> to them. So that oh ex-girlfriend, I hear she was like, she was like a stripper, an escort or something. Oh, so, okay, okay. So I, I don't think she was wearing a lot of clothes in the pictures, but this is just my speculation. But they, they took away the laptop. They said, we'll give it back when you leave. But I think that's pretty scary to him. Yeah. And North Korea is very backwards by our standards. And I think we probably all heard of this, but it's not really apparent until you see it in person. So they took us to a teacher's college, for example. And I remember that the power went out while we were there. And it also went out several times in my hotel. And I saw them using an unactivated version of Windows. And they brought us along to... So the conference was only two days, but we were there for seven days. So they showed us around the country. And... They showed us some of their, their businesses, like they were manufacturing computer equipment or whatever, electronics. And they were, it seems as if they were showing off things to us, but it's extremely unspectacular things like TV media boxes. And there was this game they made, an arcade game. And it looks like it was an arcade game from like 20 years ago. And one of the games, there was even no levels. You, know, you just, you grab a gun and you just kill cows. And I don't think there's any objectives. I don't even know if the game even ends if you kill enough cows, but you just shoot at cows. That, that, that was one of their games. That was, uh, and they, they drank a lot as well. There were lots of mm. nights when we drank a lot with our North Korean minders. And that was the whole trip. I did not expect it to make the news in the way that it did. You drank a lot with these people, but then you weren't allowed to talk to them, I thought. Oh, our North Korean minders. So the, like, they minders. assigned... Oh, yeah. they, they, these are the people that you got assigned. Yeah, they assigned, like, a two... I guess two people they were with us throughout, and they had a boss who was with us intermittently. I see. And they were tasked to stay with you and make sure you, you had, a, I guess, a good time. Okay, yes. so where does the story go next? <clears throat> I like the cover of your book, by the way. It looks cool. Once a Bitcoin miner. I like the digital. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's cool. The colors and stuff look awesome. Oh, yeah. You should see the physical one. So the it, it's actually shiny. So it's like silvery shiny. So that the colors nice. is just a, a representation of the shininess. Mm. But anyway, this story, it ended, North Korea ended unspectacularly. Hmm. I, I didn't expect anything to happen, but about six months afterward, it was Thanksgiving in the US and Virgil got arrested. And the day after Thanksgiving, we all wait, saw the wait, press Sorry, you release. came back. Sorry, you came back from North Korea now, right? Sorry, I missed something. I was just sharing your screen. You came <laughs> back. Are we back yet? We're back in the US. Where are you? Are you in Toronto, safe at home? Yeah. I was actually in Calgary at the time. So I spent some Calgary. time living in Calgary, but interesting. Okay. And safe then at home. Yeah. And this is six months later. You said this is the year end. So how many months later is after the event or whatever? Probably seven, six, seven months. Yeah. Okay. And what happens? We found out that Virgil got himself arrested. Got himself arrested. Okay. What does yeah, that mean? I think he's the architect of his own misfortune in lots of ways because in North Korea, like I, I told you just now, he was telling us he was going to talk to State Department officials. And I think he thought he was helping out his government by giving them intel on North Korea. But somewhere along the way, I think, and I, I don't know this for a fact, I don't know how the FBI got involved, but clearly if you're talking to the State Department and you're talking to the FBI a couple of weeks and months later, I think it's because of your chat with the State Department. And he voluntarily talked to the FBI and he voluntarily let them search his phone. And yeah, which we like you, you watch those movies, every movie and TV show, they tell you never talk to the cops without a lawyer. But he, he seemed to think that, and I, I think he believed he got this impression from the FBI that they were not after him at all. So 
I think he eventually lawyered up, but I think that was when he knew that they they weren't talking to him just out of curiosity. They had a purpose, and he was flying home for Thanksgiving to uh, to be with his sister's family. From where uh, to where? LA to Baltimore. Okay, so within the U.S. Okay, and that was where he got arrested. And they took him away on what grounds? Because he visited North Korea. No, he tried to help North Korea evade sanctions through his mm. talk at in North Korea, and he also, according to the U.S. Uh, government, tried to set up like an Ethereum node in North Korea and to effect a symbolic transfer of one ether between the North and the South. And that was all taken into consideration. Basically the charges that he had, the charge is quite simple and subjective. It's that he had the intention of helping North Korea break sanctions and he had acted on the intent. So by going there, by giving that talk and doing what he did afterward, and maximum sentence is 20 years in prison. And what happened? So he got arrested and he's in jail for 20 years? Oh, no. Well, he got arrested. They have to bring him to trial first. So this was toward the end of 2019. So hmm. from then all the way until now, he has been dealing with this. So they granted him bail at first, but then he tried to access his cryptocurrency to use it, to sell it, to, to pay his lawyers because he had the absolute rock stars of lawyers. Like they, those are like famous lawyers and they're, they're pretty expensive. And, but his bail conditions was that he can't access crypto. He can't even access the internet, but he was saying that he wasn't the one accessing it and it was, he was doing it through his mother, but Ultimately, bail was revoked and they hauled him back to jail. And in September, so I was in New York, I was in court. Supposed to be a two-week trial, but he pleaded guilty on the first day and took a plea deal, six and a half years maximum. Was this, did this make the news? Was it that big of a... Did people talk about it much? Because I don't think I, I heard a little bit, but not about it. Oh, yeah, man. It, it was in the New York Times. Okay. When he, I guess, Those when he got arrested and when he, I wrote about it in the news, in the Financial Post and in Coindesk as well. Interesting. Yeah, I, I guess it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. Wow. What is takeaway? Is there, is there something that, I don't know, something positive out of this or is it just is what it is? Is it his <laughs> naivete? Did, was he in the wrong? Was he in the right? Is he just like a simple... <sighs> How do I put this? Look, I don't know Virgil, okay? And I don't like, <laughs> I don't like, you know, putting people in the boxes, but like, I know a lot of people who like Ethereum and they tend to be programmers, younger, a little naive, and they think the world is a video game to some extent. So I can totally see how through that worldview, you would do all of those things, which is like North Korea. It's another place on earth. Let's go there. These people from the government, they look super friendly and nice. They're smiling. Let's talk to them. I could just totally see all of that. Anyways, I'm probably going to make more enemies by saying that, but I could see <laughs> that. And it breaks my heart to some extent. It breaks my heart to hear that. Um, the world is, is unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know more than that. And there's a, a lot of nuance and there are bad guys out there. Some of them come in the form of Gerald Cotton that look like, I, and, a, and most of them are, right? Most of them are. They all smile and they're nice. And so it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. You know, I think people listening to this, they're going to either react one of two ways. Like, how on earth could he go to North Korea? Is he crazy? Like, obviously, he had this coming. But then on the flip side, there could be a lot of people just, okay, he just decided to go to some place on earth and go to a speak at a Bitcoin conference. <laughs> but that, I don't know, to me, it's, it sounds a little much, but who am I? I'm not a judge or a lawyer or any, anyone, but sounds a bit harsh for, for, I don't know, speaking at a conference, I guess, for about, about stuff that's already public. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I. <laughs> what's I your TLDR? You, yeah, what's your takeaway? I think you hit the nail right on the head when you described, I guess, some Ethereum people as playing life, living life as if it was playing a video game because that was how Virgil was described by someone that he he th- used life as a video game and. I, I don't think he had any bad intentions, but the, there's this book called Three Felony Today, which basically says that it's written by a lawyer that says most of us, we would commit that many crimes every 24 hours without realizing it because we have a lot of laws and how laws are enforced. Because you have more, law, more laws than you have resources, it's always selectively applied. San Francisco, for, for example, they deprioritize marijuana possession and the New York, Southern District of New York, the branch of the federal justice department that went after Virgil, every head of the Southern District has been known for a focus. So Preet Bahara had gone after Wall Street and Rudy Giuliani, back when he ran it, he went after the mafia. And so there's always like a a focus for law enforcement. And I think in this case, North Korea, national security, and I think it's a very big deal for them. And ultimately it's not about Virgil. It's about sending a message. It's about making an example of someone. And he did break the letter of the law. You know, he already pleaded guilty. They had a case and a core pillar of justice is deterrence to show people the consequences of something to make sure they don't attempt it. I think that's what they're doing here. Making an example. That's heavy. Yeah. I got, I got anything else? I guess the book. So what is it? What does the book do? Does it, it's about all of that? Like you, you getting to North Korea or buying, is it from your, you buying Bitcoin all the way to the, the end of the story or how does it play out? Yeah. It's uh Yes, yeah, starts with me buying Bitcoin and it does depict North Korea. But I have to say, I, I, I was not planning to write about this when I went to North Korea because I did not expect Virgil to end up arrested and this whole thing to be so big and, and uh, so heavy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that, that is there. And ultimately, this book, it's, it's a story. It's a narrative. It's driven by characters and plot. I, I feel... Lots of people, when they look at crypto, it's always through the lens of monetary policy or or computer science. But I think there is this aspect of the human condition, this lens of that, that that's not often looked through. And that's what I try to do with the book. What does the title of your book have to do with any of that? Oh, I I I started a mining, I started a mining (laughs) facility. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. I, 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 I'm glad you asked. Yeah. I think I did quite a lot of things in the crypto world. So <laughs> I started mining for a while and it, it was fun in its own. How did you land on that title? Did you A-B test it or something? <laughs> Sorry. Actually, I did. These titles like publishers, your agent, and, and like you, you like brainstorm and you obsess over this. And I had like, uh, I like a survey monkey thing. I pick some of my Sweet. friends and I even pick the demographics. Mm. So th- this was how we ended up with the title. Interesting. Interesting. And, and was this your first book? Ethan? No, it's, uh, it's actually my second book, but it was the first book that first book that uh, first book deal that I got and the first book that I wrote, but it just so happens that last year, I was traveling right before the pandemic hit and I was just stuck with all those like pandemic restrictions and everything. And I ended up writing another book. So that got published last year. And because of that, that pushed my first book to this year. But yeah, first book that I wrote. Sorry, you just said second book, no? What was the other one then? What was the other book you uh, wrote? Uh, it's all called right. Feel, Feel Notes from a Pandemic. But mm. so... The, this is the first book that I wrote, but the second one to be published. Got it. Got it. And, and what was that process like? 
I guess you said you're a journalist, you've been writing, I guess, short, shorter form for some time, but, but what was it like writing this book? And you said you got a book deal. What does that mean? Did you just do it yourself or did you, some publisher came to you and said, you, I need you. How did it, how did it work out? But when you deal with uh, mainstream publishing houses, you usually have to have an agent hmm. because they, they don't deal with authors directly in terms of signing you. And so basically, if you start from ground zero, how to write a book, you have to put together for, for nonfiction, you have to put together a proposal and get an agent to sign you. And then afterward, the agent uh, pitches those publishing houses for you. Interesting. Uh, cool. Yeah. Cool. And you did it. So now you got the book. Anything else, Ethan, that you want to share? That's a, it's, I'm sure people have to read the book to get the, the inside scoop on all this. I think it would be, it sounds fascinating. But anything else you want to share about, about the book, about, I don't know, your journey in Bitcoin? Oh, I should, I should say, I, you know how uh, like, like supermarket cashiers, they, they keep getting asked a question, if the item doesn't scan properly, is it free? And I, I keep getting a question as well. Can you buy the book with Bitcoin? I went through a lot of trouble to try to make that happen. Like I, I paid some young woman in the Philippines to come up with a list of every bookstore in Canada. And I emailed every single one, but so I finally succeeded that there's a shop in Saskatchewan that accepts Bitcoin for it now. No way. Cool. Yeah. That, that sounds okay. So someone can what go online and buy it with Bitcoin. Is that what, is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. So maybe give it to me. I can put it in the show notes and I don't know anything else you want to leave people with. No, I think that's great. I, I've interviewed a few authors and I'm not going to lie. I, I, I would love to someday write a book. I'm, I, I just, I, I just wouldn't even know where to get started. <laughs> but I think there's definitely a lot of stories over the last 10 years that we could, could talk about. But I, I think that's awesome that you've articled your kind of lens, your, your view of what you experienced. So awesome. I think that's great. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, then Ethan, I can bring this one to a close. And where do people find more about you? I'm on your website. So ethanlau.com. That's one place. Yeah, that's it. I'm I'm on Twitter, Ethan underscore L O U. Perfect. Okay, yeah, that, that's basically it. And if people want to buy, can they buy it on like Amazon or whatever? Or like, where do people buy your book? Yes, you can buy it on Amazon. But as I always tell people, I like to support local businesses, so I I, I try to buy it from a, a local bookstore. Cool. And if you go to my website, you can buy it with Bitcoin. Lovely. Oh, so wait, if people go to your website, is that in are you tied to the Saskatchewan based store or something? Or how, how does that or no, you just plugged it in with some BitGo, I mean BitPay or something like that. Oh, they have that on there and I, I just have a link to them. Beautiful, beautiful. Love it. Okay. Like I said, I do love the, the title, the front, the story sounds fire. Uh, I think people should go, you know, check it out and maybe it sounds like there's some good lessons to be learned there. All right. Thank you, Ethan. Really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, we'll bring this one to a close. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure.